Rolling? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you explain to me the Soviet law regarding uh, leaving the country in 1960s? In the 1960s? The Soviet law? The Soviet law. Well, only on, a, on business, official business. And uh, if uh, it was a tourist trip, I mean, then you had to go through special procedures, I mean, checking your background, <laughs> whether you <laughs> will be authorized to travel uh, on your... I mean, actually, there were only group tourism. There was no individual tourism at the time. Well, the Soviet system was totally, I mean, uh, as they say, totalitarian. That's what it was, actually. And uh, I uh, was raised and uh, educated in that system. Why, why was it not allowed? What was the reason? Well, uh, foreign, uh, uh, well, uh, spies, uh, I mean, uh, ideological subversion. I mean, the Soviet system was so... Uh, uh, concerned about uh, its uh, domestic uh, uh, policies, that any exposure to foreign uh, culture, f foreigners in general, was viewed as a potential threat to the Soviet system. And that kind of a fear and, uh, well, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, well, literally, literally uh, just uh, part of the uh, Soviet mentality. Uh, and it lasted till the collapse of the USSR. On official business, once you're authorized, that's okay. And that I was an official of Soviet uh, system at the time. So I traveled a lot from Australia to Brazil, you know, and Canada and all over Europe, you know, but that was official. Uh, otherwise, uh, normal, I mean, regular citizens, would not do that. I mean, even if they had money, uh, they had to have special clearance for, for travel abroad. So, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Could you drop your level down just a little bit? Sure. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, what did you, was it if people, uh, and what happened if people ask for, if people ask for permission to leave, how was it? And they got to case, live, the, to to leave the country. If they if they ask for permission, what would happen? Well, uh, there were no private uh, uh, permissions, with very few exceptions. If some relatives, I mean, but that was uh, generally the Soviet system was a closed system, and any exposure to a foreign country was viewed as a potential threat to the country and its system. You know. That was a totalitarian system. I mean, uh, th that's exactly what uh, led eventually to the downfall of the system because people would not want to live, uh, you know, in, 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 under, you know, the threat of being put in jail or you know, fired from job. I mean, things led to the downfall of the Soviet system eventually. And, and you at that time, uh, obviously now you think different about the Soviet Union, but at that time you were, what, what, what was your opinion at that time of, 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 the, um, of the Soviet system? Well, I was a, 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 Soviet, a Soviet system sort of representative abroad. Uh, first time I went abroad was to the United States as a Columbia University uh, Fulbright Scholar. So um, of the uh, 18 students who came to the United States for the first time as part of the exchange program. 18 Americans went to Russia. Of the 18 students, 10 were officers of the security and intelligence. One was a party official, I mean, from the Communist Party Central Committee. Uh, and uh, seven were informers of the KGB. <laughs> I mean, so there was a, you know, <laughs> picture of the country, as a matter of fact, reflected the nature of the system. And later I would come again as a Radio Moscow correspondent at the United Nations, but again it was a, another, another cover. And finally I landed in Washington as a press officer of the Soviet Embassy. And, uh, uh, well, uh, actually uh, in charge of intelligence operations in the United States. Did people, 
did people in the here in the U.S. like did they know that uh, you're not allowed to leave Russia? I'm asking this because I saw uh, like Khrushchev. I saw him in a speech saying uh, that no one wants to leave Russia. Everybody's happy. Well, that's part of the uh, Soviet. Uh, I mean, uh, a special. Uh, oper operation to impress the world that the Russians are the happiest in the world and everyone should envy the Russians. Well, in fact, there were a lot of uh, social, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, you know, privileges which uh, in the West were not known. Uh, uh, well, uh, for instance, uh, you cannot be unemployed. You have to work, and you, they will find a job for you anywhere. But no unemployment at all. Very cheap housing, extraordinary. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, ten times lower than in the United States or anywhere else. People could afford. Well, uh, if they. Uh, needed to improve their housing conditions, they would have to ask the local officials, uh, and the local officials would, will consider and probably improve their conditions anyway. So the problem was with food. At one point there was uh, a shortage of food. No sausage, you know, <laughs> no meat, uh, and little fish, no Russia. It's a rich country, I mean, in, in natural resources and everything, but uh, because of the system, People would stand in line for to buy bread. Can you imagine? That was before Gorbachev came to power, and he well uh, introduced major uh, liberal reforms, which changed the uh, life of the people, but eventually led to the collapse of the USSR. You see. So, uh, you know, uh, this film is about mainly about the hijacking of the plane in 1970. Do you remember? Well, I do remember, but uh, that was a major scandal. But uh, hijacking in, in any country by laws of, of the, any civilized country would be considered as a crime. So in Russia, it was more than a crime. It was a political, I mean, uh, sort of uh, kind of a, of a symbol of protest. Uh, and that would be punished even more severely than just simple hijacking. <laughs> do, do you remember when you, uh, how did you hear about it for the first time? Well, I uh, uh, well, uh, was uh, from my childhood um, uh, listener of the BBC and the Voice of America, the Russian service. Later I would switch to English service. And I would know the news exactly as it happened, I mean, or reported by the Western media, so. Do you think, um, how do you think that, that um, how did the Soviet Union, uh, you were in uh, America at that time, right? Or you were in Russia? Yeah, I was in, uh, actually from 58 to 1970, for 12. Yeah, the, the, the so plane 12 was years. in June mm -hmm. 1970. And I know that in the Soviet Union, uh, it was, uh, you know, in, it was considered a crime because it is a crime. But on the other hand, in America, they were considered heroes. Why do you think, though, why do you think it was such a different perception between two nations? Well, uh, the Soviet system uh, was viewed by the Soviet I mean, officials and by many Russians as well as a superior system, as the one which will eventually replace all other systems in the world. And socialism and communism will be all over the world. And actually part of the uh, um, substantial part of um, financial uh, and uh, physical uh, human resources were just uh, to achieve the goal, to undermine the West and to eventually win over and turn them into socialist countries. So that was, well, Eastern Europe at one point, as you know. Well, that was uh, uh, because of the Russian uh, military advance against Nazi Germany. We occupied Eastern Europe and would never let any other country, I mean, any country of Eastern Europe, to leave the so-called socialist camp. Well, uh, so um, I recall uh, 
uh, when in Czechoslovakia in 1968, there was a, an attempt to become a little more independent. The Soviet tanks moved into Prague to crush the Czech you know, revolution. And that would uh, continue until the collapse of the Soviet system. Now the Russians care about, not so much about the world, but about its own integrity. I mean, uh, because uh, there are lots of um, um, national elements, well, the war in Chechnya, in Dagestan, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, guys um, living in Asia who look uh, uh, eastwards rather than to Moscow. They find, say, China more interesting and more attractive uh, than uh, Russia. So these uh, Russians today have other problems. They uh, are sure that the United States will not attack because Russia is a nuclear power, but the, the problem of disintegration of Russia remains very much al alive. I mean, you know, a major concern. So why do you think... Hold on one second. Okay. Hey, Jean. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you leave your arms on the ground? Because when you raise them, it comes into the shot. Because I went... Like, yeah, because you went like that, it came uh, into the fridge. Okay, fine. Great, thank you. Sure. Sorry, thank you. Um, so, this is the, 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 those 16 people, they hijacked a, a plane, which is a crime. And of course, in, in America, they also consider hijacking uh, very seriously. But still, they saw them here as heroes. Why do you think, why do you think that? Oh, well, uh, because that was uh, 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 not just hijacking. It has uh, some political uh, implications, and that's why it was viewed in the West as part of the Soviet problem. People want to get out of Russia, and they go that far, even commit crimes to just to be free. So that's the way they interpreted it in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world, but um, hijacking, I say, is a crime anywhere, I mean, in the long, in the long run. But at that time, it was viewed as a great blow to the Soviet prestige. People will commit crime, but, well, for anything, just to get out of the country. So do you, how do you think this, uh, this event affected the Soviet Union? Well, it was a kind of a, the Russian media, as you know, has been, I mean, con under control. They would not um, play about uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, games around this uh, crime, because a crime, I mean, a scandal that was very uh, fast, it just disappeared from the media. Russian media was totally con controlled as well, as you know, so they would never say something of their own. Uh, if the government says no, <laughs> there will be no news and no comments. Um, why, why, do, um, why do you think at the end the, the government decided to reduce the death sentence? Because do you remember they received yeah. death sentence to... Well, that's... Um, just, just one second. Yeah. Yes. Well, this happens uh, sometimes, you know. It's, it's, well, it was also uh, propaganda trick. We punish people who commit crimes, but we, well, we are not, I mean, merciless. We will pardon them, forgive them once they served... Uh, a certain term for the crime committed. Uh, the death sentence was reduced after eight days mm -hmm. because it was there were a lot of um, demonstration all around the world. Do you think? Do you think uh, it affected? Why? Why was the Russian affected from demonstrations? Do you, Do you think? That well, demonstrations in Russia were allowed only. Uh, if if the government wanted it, otherwise they were illegal, and yeah, would never be. <laughs> I mean, uh, that was uh, just an act of illegal. Well, I mean, hooliganism, whatever you call it. So in 1970, there was a big demonstration in uh, Moscow, a quiet demonstration against the trial, and um, I think that there were KGB around, but I think. They didn't know what, to, like, I, you say it's illegal, it's like hooligan. Absolutely. But what would you do, you were 
uh, official uh, general of the KGB, what would you do if you see uh, there were a lot of people demonstrating and there is also television from the West coming to cover it. Can you do something about it? Can you arrest them? What can you do? Well, uh, you know what? Uh, all my life I worked in the intelligence service. My job was to steal secrets and undermine the Western world or uh, anti-Soviet world. I did not work inside. Well, at some point uh, when I had clashes with my uh, KGB leadership, I was assigned to uh, Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg, my native city. And KGB chairman Andropov at that time, uh, he saw me before departure and said, Oleg, you lived too long in the West and for your own, uh, well, better future. You should learn something about your own country. Why don't you go to Leningrad, your native city, for a couple of years? And I promise you'll be back in a couple of years. In a couple of years, Andropov passed away, and I stayed seven, for seven years in Leningrad. And that's what turned me around. I became a dissident of inside the uh, Soviet KGB system. And um, at some point, I... Um, wrote letters to the Russian Pravda, you know, major Communist Party newspaper that was never published. And then I went public and just vo voiced my concerns and uh, my disgust with certain features of the Soviet system. And I was to be put in jail. But a miracle happened. On the day I was to appear at the military uh, prosecutor's office to face charges of uh, treason or whatever, I was uh, uh, registered as a candidate to the Soviet parliament and obtained immunity from prosecution. And in fact, I became a member of the Soviet parliament and a million two hundred thousand people voted for me for the guy they never heard before. I mean, so six months before I was total, totally unknown because I worked in the intelligence service. And I was elected a member of parliament, obtained immunity from prosecution. I became even more vigorous in my attack on the Soviet system. I mean, uh, saying that it needs uh, profound, uh, I mean, reforms, and eventually, well, these reforms happened. But that also led to the disintegration of the Soviet system. The Soviet system could not keep it, you know, all together. Because in the old days, violence, fear, you know, and murders, whatever, would, be, would stand behind the Russian people. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, well, it was all over, no fear. And people would just, well, have a different way of life. It was uh, very brave of you, by the way. Hmm? It was very brave of you. I know I... I well, that. I did face problems, but I say I was saved from uh, jail by the people of Russia. Um, going, going, going back to the, to the trial, after the, after the death sentence was reduced, it was in December 1970, so in 1971, they were suddenly releasing a lot of Jews from the United States. Actually, in 1970, there were uh, 300,000 Jews released from the United States. From the, uh, from the so, so Soviet Union, sorry. Yeah. From the Soviet Union, yeah, 300,000. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Sorry, U.S. Um, which, do you think, do you think it was, because um, I have a theory. You tell me what you think. I think that uh, the Soviet Union tried to show the world that it's a paradise and everybody's happy. And once the trial happened and the, the world suddenly understand it's not so good, so they tried to show, okay, here we go, we release people. What do you, what do you think about it? Because it's a huge difference. Well, I mm, uh, took a uh, uh, very active and uh, I would say, a uh, vigorous position on the immigration of Jews. In fact, because of my direct access to KGB Chairman Andropov, I told him at some point that we have to allow Jewish immigration. First, we shall uh, uh, get rid of some of the dissidents inside the country. And uh, second, we will uh, uh, just... Uh, uh, so, well, shut up Western propaganda. And third, we shall use uh, some of the Jews as Soviet uh, assets 
who would live in Israel or in the United States and would report to the KGB, well, vitally important information. So three reasons which were uh, accepted, and that's how the doors opened to Jews to emigrate. <laughs> no wonder at some point later <clears throat> in my life, may I have some water? Okay, yeah, can, can you? Um, let's, let's, let's have a water break for yeah. a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A water break, just regular one. <coughs> Thank you. It gets hot under those lights. Mm -hmm. It gets hot under the lights. <coughs> no, it's my uh, throat. Too. Mm -hmm. okay. I talked uh, yesterday all evening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you come to New York and then everybody wants you to talk all the time. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'll, I'll put it right here. Okay. <clears throat> so, what year was that when you told that to Androkin? <coughs> Well, as a result, at some point, um, I was invited by the Israeli government as a guest, as a tribute to my uh, well, role in resolving the uh, Jewish, um, and I was a guest of the Defense uh, Minister of Israel. I have a gift from him, it's in, in Washington, you know, good uh, uh, ceramic uh, made in Israel, I mean, but his uh, signature on the back. So I was a guest of the Israeli government uh, because uh, it was a well, kind of a gesture of gratitude that I was involved and, well, uh, well, sort of with some success. What year was that when you, you got involved for the Jewish immigration? Which well, that was when uh, Yuri Andropov was still alive. He would listen to my advice, you know. Uh, I was not directly under his, I was chief of foreign counterintelligence. Uh, which had four major missions, uh, well, recruiting uh, uh, intelligence, counterintelligence, and police people around the world. Of course, the United States was number one. <clears throat> Second, to penetrate and work inside the emigre, I mean, uh, organizations of emigres from Russia, Russian, Ukrainian, Armenian, uh, Baltic states, you know, to uh, uh, recruit people and you know, create the fifth column so inside the country. Third was the protection of the Soviet citizens abroad. I mean, diplomats and uh, correspondents and trade officials or whoever. Well, to re I mean, protect them from potential recruitments by the Western services, Israeli or whatever. And finally, to watch uh, KGB officers abroad to see that they do not betray the country as well. So the f four major missions I was in charge for many years. And uh, we had, well, well, the system failed anyway. But um, in my um, position at the time, uh, I was a successful officer. No wonder I became a general at the age of 39. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you were the youngest general, right? Huh? The youngest general. The youngest, well, that's right, in the KGB history. Um, really quickly. Do, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I have really, one more question. Can you oh, go okay. get food? Yes. That'd be great. Would you, would you like some lunch? Hmm? Would you like some lunch? No. No. Okay. no. That's too early. Yeah. Uh, too no, early no. for lunch. Okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I have one you more wanna, question. You want to yeah. make a break? Yeah. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. We have uh, like two, two, three more questions and oh. then you are free. Okay, but, okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> but I sneak out. Yeah, she sneaks out. Thank you. Thank you, guys. See you soon. Um, I'll, let, I'll let you ask yeah, the I'll next ask question, okay? But I have just one more. Um, do you think there is a chance that uh, Russia today will be will close its gates again? Will be closed again? No, I don't think so. The system has changed radically, and any attempt to impose uh, restrictions on travel as it was in the USSR, would not be accepted. Don't forget the new generation, the young people are growing and, you know, become uh, public figures and they would not uh, let this happen. The Soviet system in many ways reflected uh, the Stalin's regime. I mean, the terror, but it was a police state, you know, uh, ever since uh, Stalin's, you know, death, uh, Russia was on a different Oops. <laughs> different 
path. Just a second, uh, it's gonna yeah. have to mm-hmm. wait. Call from Lorigan Candley. Sorry about that. Call it's okay, John. Lorigan Candley. Okay, my turn. <laughs> okay, we'll wait for it to we'll go wait, to the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> At least it only happened once. Yeah. That's not the worst case scenario. <laughs> yes. We were interviewing someone and the outside was so noisy, like people sure. parking, oh, remember? Yeah, I remember and airplanes. <laughs> this is fine. Um. I lost my train of thought. Do you remember? You you were asking if it uh, oh, would ever be the same. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he, he thinks No, I say the new generation of Russians, oh, the younger ones, they would never allow things to go back. They are proud of their own country, uh, but they would not want to re- restore, you know, terrorist state like it was under Joseph Stalin. Though there is a number of people who still adore Stalin and buy him, but that was a that's also a minor, minority. Uh, I think it's gonna continue beeping, so maybe can you do something about it? <laughs> yeah, write it down exactly. <laughs> Uh, fine, would you like to ask your yes, questions? Uh, let's, let's change uh, seats, so mm, he's okay. the new interrogator. Why, hello. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, Just a second, sorry. Yeah, no Just, uh, <coughs> Do you need any more water before I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you describe to me the process at the immigration office if I was to go in there and try to, in 1970, if I was going to go to the immigration office in 1970 and try to apply for an exit visa, can you describe to me what the process would be? Well, there will be no process. Uh, They will (laughs) simply, uh, there was no immigration uh, office at the time. I mean, uh, uh, it was only on government assignments uh, or tourism. Uh, Again, tourists were checked before they would obtain a, a Russian passport or, you know, over to a foreign country. And I was a member of the commission uh, which would uh, check all applicants for foreign travel. And I would provide uh, as a, well, it actually the commission consisted of puddles, but the KGB would deliver the message. And they would say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, of course, no, he should not be allowed to go. So the, in that sense, the security service was totally in control of any travel, I mean, for any personal reasons or tourism or whatever. Uh, official, of course. Are the dogs? Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just wait a minute. Um, What do you feed that dog? Danny, you want to try closing those windows there? Oh, yeah. Uh, they're yeah, they should, yeah, they're open. Oh, okay. It's really quiet here. We, yeah, it's really it nice. Super mm-hmm. quiet, yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful place, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it. So you live in D.C. currently? Do you live in D.C. currently? No, I live in Maryland, but Maryland, uh, okay. close uh, to, well, it's a half an hour drive to okay. the White House. Yeah, <laughs> so, not, not, not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, I also have a, a, a job in uh, downtown Washington okay. as a member of the board of directors of the International Spy Museum. Wow, that's cool. Uh, yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, that's great. That actually locked them out. Well, is that thing stopped working? But it's good. No, we'll just pretend like we did it. Okay. That's great. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, do you think the first Leningrad trials in 1970 affected immigration? Uh, not really. Uh, the Soviet system uh, at that time 
felt uh, very uh, firm itself in the as a leader of the country, and they were, would do anything they wanted. Uh, with the death of Stalin, as I said, uh, uh, some uh, acts of terror were just abandoned uh, against the citizens. But the jail's term was a normal thing, you know. <laughs> so that was part of the Soviet system. No one would be allowed to travel abroad unless you would be authorized by the government officials. Tourists or whatever, doesn't matter. That's great. Um, so two, two of the activists, activists were sentenced to death. Why do you think they, they weren't killed and just sent to work camps? Well, that was probably an act of mercy uh, by, you know, on the part of the Russian government to show that they also have some uh, human uh, sort of uh, nature. They are not that ruthless and uh, would necessarily kill people. And that was a gesture of goodwill and there were lots of, uh, I mean, public concern all over, all over the Western world and the Russians did not want to go against the general opinion at that time. In Stalin's times they would not, not care, but after Stalin's death they did care. They do care today. Wow. And um, do you think the Soviet Jewry movement had an effect on the Soviet Union? Uh, the Soviet Jewry? Yeah, Jewry movement, um, all the Jewish activi activists around the world. Um, well, uh, the uh, uh, influence of uh, from the outside was minimal at the time, and uh, as I probably mentioned earlier, uh, all foreign broadcasts were jammed. I mean, BBC, Voice of America. I mean, uh, uh, well, so if you knew foreign language, then you would probably listen to foreign broadcasts. But if uh, and the Russian system was based on reporting people on each other. If someone learns that you listen to the uh, foreign broadcasts regularly, they would report to the KGB and the KGB would start investigating. What's his here? Maybe he's getting some uh, intelligence, I mean, instructions from the West or something, you know. Uh, this, uh, uh, I say, uh, suspicion system of uh, uh, terror, of uh, distrust of people was, well, uh, perhaps the main feature of the Soviet, so-called so socialism, brand of socialism. Now, when, uh, when the Soviet Union or the KGB was to investigate somebody, what, what was the process of, um, so let's say somebody thought that I was a terrorist or something like that? Again? They would put him in jail and then interrogate him. Uh, well, sometimes they would use physical force to obtain information. That was in Stalin's time, and at some, well, in some instances, uh, I read some of the uh, archives when I was a young man, and I was amazed. Uh, one guy was arrested in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, on suspicion of being a terrorist or something, put in jail. They tried to squeeze uh, some information from him by force. Uh, well, when it was uh, eventually uh, understood that he was not involved in any uh, evil, you know, attempts to overthrow the you know, committed terrorist act. Uh, he was so severely bitten that uh, the uh, decision was just to get him physically, just killed, and that's it. But instead of releasing him out and saying, uh, you know, compensation or forgiveness, no, he was just killed. He was part of the system. Wow. Um. Why do you think the KGB waited to arrest the activists at the airport instead of arresting them in advance? Well, apparently they were not sure, I mean, or did not know, I mean, well enough. They were not, not well, had they known for sure that the guys are going to hijack, they would stop it. They would not allow them to, because that, you know, you know, could end in a, a I mean, a sort of a tragedy. I mean, people would uh, be innocent people, but all victims of that. So they learned about it while when the flight was, you know, oh, the hijacking happened during the flight, as you know. And they obviously did not have information before that. So do you think, um, do you think that if they would have succeeded in hijacking the airplane and leaving uh, the USSR, 
do you think it would have had a bigger effect or no effect at all compared to what happened to them being arrested in the West, finding out about it? Well, uh, if uh, uh, some of the Western countries uh, accept the hijackers, that would be a major international scandal. Well, uh, the current case of uh, uh, NSA and National Security Agency, uh, uh, Snowden, who is kept in Russia, no, has become a scandal. I mean, nothing really happened, but the guy asked for political asylum and obviously, well, transferred uh, some, um, you know, I mean, classified information to the Russians. But because of the different state of relationship between the West and the Russia, the Russia today, uh, the Snowden case uh, has been uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, more, you know, treated in a delicate manner. I mean, uh, Russians were trying to somehow smooth the, the situation. They would not let him out of the country and, uh, because he would be arrested in the United States. On the other hand, they tried to keep the United States happy and try, you know, with all sorts of promises, pledges, and, well, as you know, the President of the United States canceled his trip to St. Petersburg, where he was supposed to meet um, President Putin because of the Snowden's affair. But uh, the Russians, just uh, that's uh, their old policy. They would never surrender people who allegedly, uh, well, uh, are, are victims of the uh, Western uh, uh, Int Intelligence or Security Service. That has been going on for decades. And uh, though Russia ch changed radically, the old system in many ways prevailed. So do you think it would have had a bigger effect if they left or if they had succeeded? Or do you think that because they didn't succeed? Well, if they succeeded, then uh, some other Russians would say, oh, we'll try to. Yeah, that would probably provide uh, a bad uh, you know, example for some Russians who did not want to live in Russia anymore. Oh, if these guys succeeded, why don't we try? But they were, I mean, that hijacking was stopped, and others would think twice before doing the same. Um, let's see here. I have one more question. Actually. Yeah, sure thing. You want to change? Yeah, change. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need some more water? No, no, I have. No, I have. I have. <laughs> so yeah, one. I think one last question, but maybe we. It you, might turn into. Two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, can you tell me what was considered to be a betrayal in the country? Uh, and can you start by saying uh, betrayal was considered? Well, any attempt to leave the country without authorization was a crime. That's, well, in fact, it's a crime in many parts of the world, but uh, you can get uh, the legal documents in most parts of the world and travel around. In Russia, it was impossible. You had to, well, had a clearance, security check behind before they allow you to leave. And everyone who, who would go without authorization was considered a criminal. That was a crime against the state. But, uh, but there were other things as well that considered to be betrayal, like, um, um, like uh, maybe learning other languages or was anything, besides trying to leave the country, people could get arrested for other things as well, right? Like, oh, sure. Well, like in any country. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, what, but, yeah, but in some countries, but what was considered to be betrayal? What could you, what can people do that can make them, and specifically, I think specifically Jews, because I know that um, they were underground, uh, learning Hebrew underground, and that was considered not allowed. So can you explain? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it was KGB chief Andropov decision to allow people to leave the country. Uh, well, as I said, to ease tensions inside Russia because of the Jewish protests and some kind of uh, uh, unhappiness of a certain part of an important part of the population, not in terms of numbers, but in terms of positions they held in, in the intellectual world, I mean, the Jewish population. And second uh, was to gag up the Western propaganda about the lack of freedom in Russia. And third, to, 
well, sent abroad KGB guys who would settle in Israel or wherever and would uh, become informers for the rest of their lives, keeping the Soviet system, I, I mean, with intelligence <laughs> information, <laughs> I mean, happy. <laughs> They're still out there, I think. Yeah. So, three, three main reasons. Uh, just a second. Is uh, the question you're, you're asking, is it, why was it illegal to learn Hebrew? And, yeah, okay. yeah. Why was it illegal? Uh, I mean, uh, was it, I'm talking about Brezhnev time, actually, not Andrapov. And I know that there were some arrests for, if you find, like, um, for Zionist underground, so that was also considered a betrayal, right? Well, in sure, in British times, it was not the worst time in the Soviet system. Stalin's time was, you know, absolutely, no one even knows how many people were uh, shot as traitors or suspected spies or, I mean, uh, hijackers potential. Uh, you know, the number of people murdered by the Soviet system under Stalin's regime is not even known today. I mean, so it's classified, it's, no, they did not count people, you know, that was the Soviet system. In Brezhnev's times, things were somewhat different, uh, but many elements of Stalin's regimes remained alive and sort of uh, pra practiced. Uh, it was Gorbachev who really uh, introduced a, a different system and allowed Russians to well, leave if they wanted to, or whatever. So in Brezhnev time, can people get arrested for learning Hebrew? For no, no, no. They, they, you know, just uh, learning something. And uh, I mean, uh, so the synagogues existed in Russia. By the way, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and when I was a young man and uh, interested in the life of other countries, I would go to every single, uh, you know, church in the in Moscow and Saint Petersburg including, you know, synagogues and Catholic Church and, you know, well, of course, Protestant and, of course, the Orthodox Church. In fact, I was a friend of the uh, Russian uh, archbishops, I mean, um, uh, patriarchs of Moscow, Pimen, uh, Alexei, and current one, Kirill. Just personal relationship, you know, <laughs> friends. Nice. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I mean, um, we can... The dissident newspaper and stuff like that. Why Kuznetsov was arrested? Oh yeah. Okay. So for example, uh, Edward Kuznetsov, who was uh, one of one of the people who got the death sentence, um, before he hijacked a plane, he was in prison for seven years because he was the editor of a newspaper called Phoenix, mm -hmm. which was a dissident newspaper. It was anti-communist. So that was enough crime to be in prison for seven years? Well, sure. Well, in the Soviet days, uh, they would put you in jail and give you... Uh, the, there was no independent uh, judicial system. Uh, the judges would make decisions based on government directives. <laughs> Actually, uh, the three system, I mean... Uh, uh, I mean... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, government, uh, uh, ju judges, uh, judicial system, uh, and of course the parliamentary system, they were all one unit, Soviet system. And no one would be allowed to do anything if the government did not want it. So can you tell me, uh, can you tell me, give me examples of what was considered a crime or betrayal that something that doesn't make sense to me like as a person who lives in the free world but something that in russia at that time in the 60s and the 70s was considered a crime enough can you tell me well uh listening to foreign broadcasts was viewed as a potential crime people would not be put in jail but they would be uh, suspected of potential conspiracy against the soviet system and they would be watched by the security and if they made them step further, uh, they would probably be arrested and charged with anti-Soviet activities. The Soviet system in that sense was very simple. <laughs> you'd, you even if you uh, have a dinner, uh, and there are more than uh, three people, uh, well, the uh, KGB will get a report about what they talked at the dinner table. Someone would report.
So they would you know, only they went two, so they could talk, you know, to each other honestly and, you know, just straight uh, 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 truth as they understood it. Because if something reports it, be be the one. So, but in a group of people, uh, people would stay, you know, just quiet. They would never or seldom utter something which may be viewed as anti-Soviet, you know, propaganda views. Uh, you know, inconsistent with the socialist system, Soviet brand. I'm good. Ruben? I'm good. That was excellent. Oh, yeah, great. So, cut. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get you a.